Let's start. I want to welcome you to the second theme in our series called Next Stop Approaching the Future of Mobility. Our event journey surfaces ideas and insights from mobility events in our four main topics, micromobility, hyperloop, simulation, and autonomous vehicles. And we are not doing this alone. It is a collaboration with the Swiss Federal Railways, SPB, and Eurotube. Over the several months, we will feature a mix of panels, presentations with thought leaders, presentations from leading startups, insights into the most cutting edge new vehicles, networking opportunities, and more. So today, I'm really impressed by the great round of speakers we have gathered to discuss the future of freight. Without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our moderator for this panel, Andreas Josen, Head of Technology and Innovation Outpost of SPP here in the USA. Andreas, please take it away. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the very nice introduction. And welcome from my side as well. Good morning, California. As you can see, I'm in San Francisco. This is the very foggy Bay Area right behind me. And good evening to Switzerland and Europe. We also have a lot of participants from, from Europe. So it's very cool to have this conversation from two different continents. So yeah, as Nicola mentioned, we'll talk about Hyperloop today, uh, about Hyperloop, especially with cargo. Uh, this topic is so huge that we decided to split it up, actually. So this week, today, we're talking about Hyperloop and its implications on cargo and the future of freight. Then exactly one week from today, we will be talking about Hyperloop and the infrastructure implications, what you need to build, tunneling, building new tracks and so on. So we will look into this and in three weeks, we'll be talking about the effects of Hyperloop, long distance travel on passenger traffic. So we'll have a whole rounded conversation about Hyperloop from three different perspectives. So, but now I'm very proud to have this super international panel. So first up on stage, I would like to invite from Cargo Sutera, Stefan Goldlöcke. And before you start introducing yourself, I have a question that I ask all the panelists at the be beginning, sort of an icebreaker. And this is, so we're talking cargo. Um, so what is the last thing or parcel that you had delivered um, to your office, to your home office um, or at home? Sitting in a home office, I recognized for whatever reason, I still needed a printer and something for scanning whatever stuff. So I, I didn't believe that I had to buy a printer once again in my life, but I did. So that was the last thing delivered. Oh, yeah. I, I need to do this every time as well. I, I don't have a printer at home. So Stefan, yeah, please tell us a little bit about yourself, about your role at Cargo Sutra, and of course, what Cargo Sutra is doing. Yeah, I'm very happy to share kind of a little bit about Cargo Sutera. My, first of all, my name is uh, Stefan Goldlöcke. I'm originally from Germany, but you, you will hear maybe with my voice, but I'm living in Lucerne, Switzerland, which is kind of the background that you see behind me. Um, I work in Cargo Sutera and I try to implement city logistics and overarching logistical system for how we transport goods throughout Switzerland. Um, I talk today uh, about uh, how we are going to do it, what we are going to do, and uh, I, probably the special implications of city logistics. And I'm very happy looking forward to the discussion with my colleagues from the other companies. So first thing, what are we addressing or why are we doing that? Uh, Switzerland, as probably most of you know, is a, a country with limited space. We have mountains in, in roughly 70% of the country, which means there's very little room for industrial applications, for, for transportation, for people living there. So landscape is very limited. And uh, as you can see in that illustration, what, what, what can you do? You can go up can go sideways or you can go down if you don't have room. So what we chose is finally to, to use the underground to move goods underneath the ground to for not further kind of wasting the very limited space across the, front, the country. What are we gonna do? Cargo Zutera has a, kind of a very bold project. We are trying to build a tunnel of more than 500 kilometers across the entire country. Uh, the line that you see on the left is, is ranging from St. Gallen 
at the eastern corner of Switzerland and then down to Geneva in the French part of the country. And that spans more than, that spans about 500 kilometers and a few side arms. What we'll build is a tunnel with three lanes underneath the ground. So you can imagine the diameter, the size of something like that. And you'll have three lanes with vehicle driving autonomous within these lanes um, that will move goods about two pallet size each of them and you you have thousands of these vehicles moving underneath the ground because we because we'll see kind of a increase in traffic more than 25 percent over the next um, one and a half decades and we don't want to see that on the streets we don't want to see that um, over the surface and and that's why we want to uh, eliminate that increase and move it underneath the ground um, what is the special thing about cargo sutera and what i'm trying and please apologize if it has to german wording uh, but i want to show kind of the system the overarching design of it what we are going to do is not only build a tunnel underneath the ground uh, but we will kind of combine all the modes of transportation we link air, water, the road, and of course the rail system. So Cargo Souterrain will build an overarching system for transporting goods that ranges from kind of the source to, um, to the recipient of a delivery, including the city logistics. It's just complete if you can provide the entire system end to end. And that's what we promised that we, we kind of manage that overarching system end to end with whatever it takes to get a, a good from one side to the other. So it's a bold vision. Our timeline is uh, being, being ready in about 2031 with the first step and then uh, into the next decade and uh, beyond to build that entire system uh, across the country. And uh, the interesting thing for me is we, we have like an ecosystem with the other companies that you will hear about here today uh, that, that kind of are touching each other. And I think that's the special thing. We are very open. We are kind of in a core petition and I'm looking forward to hear from the others. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Stefan. Really great to hear from you. Um, also, just a short reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, um, please write them in the Q&A section. We will try to answer them. So next on stage, we will stay in Switzerland. We'll talk to Gregory Inauen, who is working for Eurotube. Gregory, first of all, welcome to the panel. Second of all, same question for you. What was the last par parcel that arrived uh, at your office or at your home? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, the last uh, package that arrived at my home was actually quite, that was quite a while ago. And I was at the beginning of the first lockdown here in Switzerland. And I'm quite an, an outdoorsy person. So I, I ordered a Frisbee. So to during all those home, home office sessions to get out, uh, we have just a park close by our apartment to, uh, yeah, get some, some activity done. Great. So please tell us a little bit more about your role and sure. your Sure, happy to do so. I've also prepared a few slides I'll share now. Wonderful. So we from Eurotube, uh, we work on a, on a very important problem as my colleagues here too. It's how we can make, uh, how we can build the future of transport and especially in a sustainable manner. So we're very much focusing on how we can solve the problem to uh, currently um, build alternatives for cargo, but also passenger transport that is usually just done via aviation. So uh, Hyperloop vacuum transportation, that's what we we're, we're working on. Is, is mainly also a, a great application for long distance uh, transportation. And there we've also seen um, a huge increase in the cargo, cargo uh, CO2 emission and carbon hydrogen emission, emissions. As, as uh, now with Corona, it's maybe less in the news anymore, but, but still um, we're actually back on track on the levels from a year ago. And, and also um, looking ahead, it's, 
climate change and, and sustainable transport will be, still be a challenge. And we now with uh, our solutions are working on an alternative. So basically over those distances that are currently are mainly done via also um, air routes, we can uh, replace CO2 emissions by up to 95% by an all electric system. And we as Eurotube, uh, our mission is to accelerate this entire technology field. And uh, we are a nonprofit research organization and technology incubator. So we currently are building uh, prototypes uh, with our partners, always in, in, a, in a very collaborative fashion uh, to research and develop this technology. But we also are, are making sure that we can uh, join our, our forces. So we are also see our role as an incubator, as a research platform to make sure all the different players in the field can uh, sh share facilities, can share testing infrastructure, and are, are able to, to also um, be sh being able to share, share assets and facilities. And then also as a more uh, neutral intermediary uh, in a very Swiss fashion, we also are, see our role as a, as a part of the certification and standardization processes. Yeah. And uh, one of our biggest flagship projects currently is the Alpha Tube in Switzerland. So since two years, we are planning uh, a test track for vacuum transport here in Switzerland. So as I mentioned before, very much in the spirit of, of sharing such infrastructures between all the important players to really make sure we can collaborate and, and move this technology uh, forward as fast as possible. And we also uh, have many other uh, exciting prototypes uh, ongoing. Here just a few uh, impressions from, for example, our tube segments we're building with high performance sustainable concrete solutions or valve lock systems and so on. So we might also later get the chance to deep dive on some of those topics. Thank you, Gregory. And just a super quick follow-up question that we got from the audience. Rolf Müllermann is asking, how long is medium distance that you defined in your slide? Usually our, our reference is, is when we look at current air routes. So uh, but by that standard, usually like short, short haul flights are already defined in like, I think up to 500 or even 800 kilometers. So that would already cover entire Europe. So uh, usually what we think is, is the sweet spot for vacuum transport solutions is between uh, 50 to then up to several thousand kilometers, yeah. Great, thank you very much. So next up, we switch from Switzerland and you, we go to the UK. Next on stage, please welcome Phil Davies from Magway. Same question for you. What was the last thing that you had shipped to your apartment or your office? Hi, so great to be here. Um, I, I got a very nice surprise. Our non-exec director um, sent me, I don't know if you have a scale X trick. There's a model version, a little electric track of Magway. So it's a 3D printed Magway um, for, for me to play with. So I, it was a bit of a, a busman's um, present. I can play with Magway at home as well. Oh, very nice, cool. And before you give a little bit more about your role and what Magway is doing, you have a video, which I will be sharing right now. The progress of technology accelerates at incredible speed. Magway is at the cutting edge of this revolution. Having developed the most game-changing goods and parcels transport system in the world, utilizing existing pipe technologies with our world-renowned experience of magnetic motors. A system that will travel beneath and above ground for a pipe network, connecting distribution centers to consolidation centers, targeting the market for logistics, especially e-commerce, parcel and grocery delivery. With only half a second between carriages, efficiency and reliability is ensured. Easy integration to existing facilities, high bandwidth across the country, 24-7, to meet an ever-increasing urban demand. Autonomous transit, sustainable infrastructure with zero emissions, improved air quality, reduced congestion, less packaging, fewer road accidents, or weather, making better use of space, creating opportunities for denser, more vertical, residential and commercial development, improved customer service, efficient, predictable, saving costs in operations, saving costs in capital investment. 
creating a new delivery utility for the UK and for the rest of the world. Delivering faster for a better tomorrow. Delivering the future today. Magway. Wow, excellent video. And you also have a, a slide that you want me to share. Well, shall, so, shall I start by showing you a demonstration of the system? Yes, so, please. So that, that's, that's, our, that's our vision. Um, we are, I'm sitting in our test facility here in, in Northwest London. And behind me, you can see our operational demonstrator, which we've, which we've built. Um, and we're, the next step of the, the way is to um, effectively install a commercial system. So we're close to signing a, our, our first commercial contract. And we're hoping to do that in the first quarter of this year. But let me, let me see if I can run from my laptop the system. So that is not a virtual background. It's actually real. That is not a virtual background. Hooray, it worked. Wow. How quick is it? So that is running at six and a half meters a second. Um, so approximately 15 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to, to, to ramp up the speed, we just turn up the current. So it just draws more energy to, to, to go faster. It's going to do a, a, few, a, few, a few circuits. I hope you can still hear me. Yeah, perfect. Um, so our system is focused on, um, on, on small freight, online, online um, parcels. Um, through COVID, we've seen a 35% increase in online purchases. Um, the UK's forecast to, 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 to mirror some of the, the, the volumes um, internationally. So we're forecast to double parcel volumes to 6 billion per annum over the next five years. Similarly, global parcel volumes are forecast to, to double to 200 billion over a similar, um, over a similar time frame. Um, and what we want to do is basically take those parcels off polluting vehicles and deliver them closer to the final destination. Um, so our rollout plan is to initially um, have dedicated routes um, for dedicated users. And the commercial contract we're talking about is for a system most probably up to you know, 30 kilometers um, and eventually um, and then to have shorter routes um, and then extend those shorter routes out. Um, so I, if, you, if you want to share the slide, the first um, you know, shorter route that we're looking at is um, across West London, and that basically connects 400,000 households um, in London, uh, over a million Londoners. Um, it's an eight-kilometer route. Um, from Wilsdon Junction to the River Thames. It's the equivalent of a city the size of Amsterdam. Wow, excellent. Really cool. Thank you. We'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, last but not least, we have one more speaker coming up. Um, this is Anita Sengupta. She is a professor of astronautical engineering and also an entrepreneur who founded several startups. She's based in Los Angeles. So. Same question for you, first off. Anita, what was the last thing that you had delivered or shipped to your apartment, to your office? And you're still muted? Hi, yeah, I wasn't able to unmute it myself. Hi, uh, the last thing I had delivered to me was the chair that I'm sitting on yesterday, actually. <laughs> so I'm upgrading my, my home office as we speak. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, it says the same thing it said before, which is your screen sharing is paused, so. Yeah, so maybe just stop it and restart it again. Um, and yes, I and the audience are very interested to hear from you. What is your take on the future of freight? Um, is Hyperloop the solution what you see? And you're also bringing a totally different perspective, the air. So um, please go ahead. Give me one second. Let me duplicate this thing. Okay, hopefully you can see it. Uh, so I, um, I, I've had a long career primarily in the space program. 
And um, I was with NASA for about 20 years. And then I left to join a Hyperloop technology company, specifically Virgin Hyperloop One, where I was senior vice president of systems engineering. So I spent about two years in the space um, at the executive level focused on trying to get that as a real form of transportation on the ground for largely for passenger transportation, but certainly cargo um, was also an interesting use case for us. So I think since I've been in this space, you know, actively working it, the, there has been somewhat of an explosion of the number of companies around the world. And so now every country has at least one or two startups or bigger um, entities working on it. So I think the ecosystem is growing at an exponential rate and that's great news. And I have a few slides uh, to talk about. Um, and my background um, obviously is aerospace engineering, which covers a range of different technologies. And in terms of the freight space, obviously ground-based transportation, maritime, but there's also aviation, which is a large player in cargo transport, especially for transatlantic and transpacific. Um, so what I've been working on for the past uh, two years is electric aviation. And uh, the motivation behind that, of course, is uh, carbonization and decarbonization. So if you take a look at this graph here, um, what's interesting is that because all ground-based forms of transit are now shifting over to emission-free, whether that's using batteries or fuel cells, um, aviation is becoming a larger and larger player in terms of total CO2 output. So now is the right time to develop the technologies necessary to decarbonize aviation. And a lot of that does come from the PowerPoint that you plan on using. So. Um, I've spent a few years in the space focused on uh, what technologies are needed to develop electric aviation. But if you think about the motivation for the biggest one, of course, is to address global warming, um, address climate change, because you get fewer emissions if you can shift over to either a stored energy system based off of batteries or fuel cells. Um, there's other advantages, um, which is that with an electric motor, you can actually be much more quiet than a traditional turbine or, or piston type of system. Um, you actually can have higher reliability, which it's important in the context of safety. And you can have lower costs because if you're operating off of electricity, uh, you can have significantly lower fuel costs or energy costs per passenger kilometer, for example, or per um, you know, kilo, kilogram or freight kilometer. And you can also have lower maintenance costs because most of the maintenance costs associated with uh, both automotives as well as aircraft, which use internal combustion engines, are to um, repair the engines. If you shift over to an electric power plant, you can significantly reduce your costs. And so there's a good business justification for shifting over to electric aviation, as well as obviously the solution to decarbonize aviation, which is necessary for climate change. And with any new technology, there has to be an evolution to implement that technology into more complicated use cases. And so electric aviation right now, of course, is in the context of drones, which could be used for surveillance, can be used for military purposes, can also be used for delivery of small items. I wouldn't necessarily call that cargo, but certainly sort of last mile delivery systems are already um, making use of drone delivery systems. When you think about it in terms of the aviation use case, you think about it in terms of range that the vehicle needs to travel and the payload that it needs to carry. So one step up from that is the general aviation use case, which is small single engine planes, which can be used for air taxis, can be used for high value cargo, or can be used for you know, passenger transit for fun, for example. There's also emergency response, same thing, short uh, range requirements, therefore more amenable to a electric aviation uh, power plant. Then shifting up to larger, more novel platforms, the air taxi space, which is pretty popular nowadays in terms of companies uh, working on it, which is electric vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, many of the technologies are being developed there. And ultimately, that feeds forward into the ultimate aviation electric use case, which is cargo and regional transport. And when you think about that in terms of engineering requirements, you're talking about the total amount of power that needs to be generated. So when we talk about single engine humanitarian aid, we're talking hundreds of kilowatts of power. When we're talking more um, short range transit, we're talking about a few megawatts of power. When we're talking about cargo and regional transport, we're talking about megawatts of power. So what we know today is that we don't have a stored energy technology to support that megawatts of power level. We're really limited down to the you know, kilowatts of power level. But the good news is that there are other solutions out there. And this of course is the trifecta um, of different um, emission-free energy technologies. And the real solution for aviation happens to be hydrogen and specifically, in my opinion, hydrogen fuel cells. So I have an electric aviation company which is developing hydrogen fuel cell specific power plant for um, aviation applications, starting with smaller use cases, but hopefully growing the technology in a modular way to support cargo and regional 
use cases. So um, happy to talk about the range of topics that we're going to have today on the panel. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anita. And let's already jump into some viewer questions that we got. We got one question from Chris Neyes, who's asking a little bit about the terminology about Hyperloop. So what exactly is Hyperloop? Is it just um, underground tube transportation uh, or tube transport? Is it with a vacuum? There's different terms. And so we, for us, we, we define Hyperloop for this panel as all kind of different um, activities, but it would be great to hear maybe a little bit from you guys since you are the experts. So is Hyperloop an umbrella term for various different solutions? Because we could see from Cargo Sutra and Stefan, your vehicles were pretty big. Um, Phil, your solution looks a little bit smaller on, on your task track. The YouTube has also different. So there's many differences in size, in speed. So what exactly um, is the clear definition of Hyperloop? Um, Stefan, do you want to go first, maybe? Yeah, that's very fine. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would say we don't consider ourselves as a Hyperloop company because uh, for us, it's more like the, the lot size one, it's the continuous flow, it's a predictable system where you can exactly say forecast end to end, when will my printer, we had that before, be at home, right at home or in my store. And something like Macway from, from my perspective is kind of a very good addendum. It comes closer to, con to the consumer, to the recipient. So that's what we talk, call the ecosystem. You have like the long haul and then you have like the city logistics and kind of getting closer into the city and, and, and Hyperloop is something very fast. So very fast as with regular trains, you use, it, you use that for long distance, but you can't really take benefit if you uh, move something at a thousand kilometers over 10 kilometers distance or so. That doesn't make much sense also from an ecological aspect. But uh, I, I'm curious to learn more about how the others see that. <laughs> Phil, do you wanna respond to that? Sure, so, so similarly, we don't think of ourselves as, as, as a Hyperloop, mm -hmm. but we, yeah, we, we love Hyperloop. We think it's fantastic, it's cool. It's, 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 it's raised the profile of, of transportation through, through pipes. Yeah, and we are, you know, there are similarities. We are a, a cousin of, um, you know, we, we use pipes and we use linear motors. We use a different type of linear motor. So they're using linear induction motors. So that's something of a catapult from one motor to another. We use linear synchronous motors. So it's a controlled um, strategy. We can control and monitor each of the carriages on our system and um, our capacity is determined by the distance between our carriages. So we can put 40,000 40 foot articulated lorries through each of our system uh, 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 you know, a week. Um, so, and, and we don't need a vacuum. We're not, we're, we're not people, we're not vacuum. And as you noticed, ours is much smaller. So each of our pipes is less than a meter in diameter. And um, so it's, it's um, got a, a much smaller footprint. Thanks, Gregory. Do you have something to add? Sure, sure, happy to do so. Uh, I mean, from our point of view, as we are working with a lot of organizations in this space, in the hyperloop space, we're also often confronted with this, this uh, terminology. So, I mean, to be honest, like maybe to start with uh, the fact, I mean, I can, I can say that in that part in, in the panel here today, uh, before we knew about the, the terminology hyperloop, uh, actually, in Switzerland in the 70s, uh, one of the first projects ever was started in the space. And then back then it was called uh, Swiss Metro. So there's for sure some heritage here. But I guess the guys back then did not have as many Twitter followers as Elon Musk, who actually defined uh, the terminology Hyperloop. And uh, I think it stuck for sure. So from our point of view, we hear in the research community often just the term, the term um, vacuum transport. It's more niche, neutral. and it's also a bit more uh, self-explaining. So it definitely refers to a vacuum being like a part of the system. So also with most of the Hyperloop organizations, I think it distinguishes its uh, like technology maybe towards others as, as Cargo Sutra or, or your, your, your Macway system for with, with using a, a, a sub-pressure environment, like a, a, an actual like partial vacuum. 
And uh, that's for sure a big part. And that's done because uh, those systems want to achieve high speeds. So it's basically this, this combination. It's, uh, it's the vacuum and, and high speeds that it is, it is very characteristic for a Hyperloop or vacuum transport system. Great. I can certainly chime in as well, if you like. Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think the name is a bit of a misnomer in the sense that you're not going in a loop and you're not going at hypersonic speed. So um, I think you can treat some element of that as it can be what you want it to be. But I would say, at least in my experience in the space, it has uh, referred to magnetically levitating, electrically propelled, uh, high speed transport in excess, um, or at least equivalent to airline speeds in a partial vacuum environment. Thanks, Anita. And let me just stay with you for, for another question. Vitus Aman, um, an SPV colleague, also asked, would drones not rather serve cities better than uh, Hyperloop uh, context? And also Stefan mentioned it, and Phil as well. Um, the interoperability, so to say, there's always this kind of cargo, be it Hyperloop or whatever you will call it, um, and, and different uh, city logistics. So, how can you actually achieve this? Do you, do you need just one system or do you have several? Do you combine air with ground and underground transportation? Anita, where do you see the best uh, approach? One of the arguments for Hyperloop um, is interoperability because it's got a potential to be able to go into city centers as opposed to be um, you know, stuck on the outskirts, allows it to combine with other forms of transportation. And because it has a sort of higher frequency of throughput as opposed to like you know, every hour, every two hours, it better aligns itself with local transportation. So ironically, the, the concept, the architecture behind Hyperloop supports interoperability uh, specifically from a public a mass transportation perspective. But perhaps the other um, panelists should uh, talk about the cargo side. Gregory, do you want to add to that? I mean, sure, I, I totally agree with Anita, like from, from that point of view, it's the interoperability is, is, is like a, it, it's, it's, it's a must, right? Like, because if you're investing in such like expensive infrastructure, you want to, first of all, really make sure you don't have them to like in, invest time and money to switch cargo or passengers for a long time, because then you lose the entire advantage. And on the other hand, also um, you, you wanna make sure you can sort of like provide a mix. So especially for Hyperloop, I think it's really important that you can, you can transport not just cargo, but also passenger or additional to passenger actual cargo. And um, yeah, I think especially interesting with the, with the different systems we, we, we've seen from Phil and from Stefan, to figure also out how this interoperability could, could work. Yeah. I think one thing that, that unites all the people on this panel and all the people in this ecosystem, this growing ecosystem, is sustainability that runs through the heart of everything that we're all doing. Um, and it is, to, to understate, it, it's a massive, massive challenge and it's gonna take a lot of effort and a lot of collaboration to make it work. And, and I suppose, and, and in order for that to happen, you know, it, you know, we see ourselves you know, interfacing with drones, with autonomous vehicles, with electric vehicles, with, with cycles, with couriers, um, for, you know, to address just a small part of the value chain. And, and there will be, and there's a role for lots of different part, uh, parties and partners to, to, to make this work um, and to, um, to, to resolve um, the, the, the issues we have around the environment. Um, that, that, that's, that's our take on it. Yeah, what, one interesting point to make is that unlike drones, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, the systems that we're presenting today aren't dependent on battery technology. So we don't need to have the environmental footprint of batteries, which is obviously improving. But we don't need to charge, we don't need to recharge those batteries, we don't need to transport the batteries. So they're, they're, they're more efficient in, in certain respects. But, but drones are very efficient if you're delivering stuff um, you know, in, you know, further afield remotely, or you need to get something there very quickly. I would talk uh, 
a bit about the special system that we have to work with. I mean, getting into a system with a new mode of transportation is very special. If you're kind of, uh, I would say, stealth underneath the ground and can dig a small tunnel, that's probably easier. But in most European cities, uh, it is so dense that you can't simply build something ultra fast on piles or whatever it is. Uh, at least from the discussions that we're having in Switzerland, almost impossible. The issue at the end of the day is always getting as close as possible into a city. I fully agree to that point. You can't kind of feed the future needs and today's and future needs from the outside. That concept is probably over, overcome now for a few decades. But the point is getting into the system, into the city is very difficult with an infrastructure that's just adding more crampy environment and just making it more complicated. You spoke about Amsterdam before, we heard that before, or if I try to envision in, in London, adding another infrastructure just on top, uh, that's probably a little bit tricky. So for us, kind of the key again is uh, combining the different modes, making it possible that we use whatever resources are already existent existent meaning like available but then using kind of an eco-friendly as long as you can say that about a vehicle an, um, ideally an eco-friendly vehicle and combination of these to to prevent making the environmental situation even worse mm -hmm. if, if i may, may add here i think a question we always get often is when it comes to to vacuum transport hyperloop is if it's above or underground um, there, I think different different visions have been presented, and we, as Stefan also said, we definitely see like both solutions are are being apl applicable. So, in very dense pop dense cities, you might need to go underground or use existing infrastructure. So, we are currently also working on concepts how such hyperloop vehicles can enter bigger urban urban zones, but then switch to the existing railway to use that infrastructure and maybe in those train stations and or current me metro systems underground and so on. And, and, and I think that's there, there definitely like the route needs to be taken in consideration. The existing infrastructure needs to be taken into consideration. And we will for sure see both underground and above ground. Yeah. Interesting. So let's stay a little bit in this interoperability mode, but circle back to the statement that Anita made uh, at the beginning. She mentioned that each country more or less has its own startup that is working in some kind of different transportation. Um, I mean, we have a solution from the UK, we have two from Switzerland. So maybe this is a question for all of you guys. Uh, should there be one single system developed for everything, one standard? Or is it better because you know Switzerland is totally different from London um, to transport an individual uh, specific tailor-made solution? So what is best? And are we approaching maybe a point where we have a hundred different systems all over the world, but they are not able to connect to each other? What are your thoughts on this? I've got some pretty uh, strong opinions on it, and I can I can take it from both sides. Uh, mm -hmm. So part of my role when I worked uh, for Hyperloop Company was the safety and regulatory side. And the absence of a regulatory framework, the absence of a common interface, um, makes it very difficult um, in terms of implementing your safety case in terms of gaining a regulatory approval. So if you think about it purely from the cost to be able to certify the system, to be able to de-risk the technology for a given customer in a given country, there's advantages to having similar similarity in the interface because you can claim you know, heritage um, from different technologies or different test tracks uh, for the system that you're trying to operate. Of course, when you apply that kind of engineering constraint, then you end up perhaps with a non-optimized system and something like a CubeSat where you have this unnecessary form factor just because everybody else is using it. But perhaps uh, an in-between way is to think about a way to develop a common engineering um, understanding so that you can benefit from the steps that individuals, companies go through to develop technologies and certify them for eventual approval from a regulatory perspective. And you, and you only need to look at the, 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 the success of, of the container industry, you know, the shipping containers, to think, you know, to think that you need some form of standardization to maximize the benefits 
on a, on a global basis. So at some point, the, you know, the idea of there being a hundred different systems and standards around the world, you know, really doesn't make, make sense. Yeah, from my perspective, I, I would say it depends what you're looking at, because uh, the closer to get to a recipient, the closer to get to the individual, be it a store or be it in a person, the smaller the shipment will be. However, the longer the distance, the, the larger the aggregation. In other words, uh, what I'm trying to say is you need to be able to, to deliver in small entities to the individual shop or consumer. But on the other hand, as, as we have seen probably for, for a long time, you need to aggregate shipments. You can't ship on a small size over a long distance because then the, the uh, scale or the, the uh, theories of scale don't apply and it just becomes too expensive. We have, we have tested that uh, with, if you just take example as uh, a parcel as an example, a delivery truck for a parcel has about 200, 300 shipments. If you try, do that, try to do that with a drone or with a bicycle, it gets a heck of traffic, I can tell you. And still that small delivery truck is aggregated into a very large truck if it comes to long distance. So you can't overcome, or it's very hard to overcome the principle of aggregation if you want to keep the prices at an acceptable level. Um. To, like uh, Andreas, you asked like there's like about like all the, the different solutions and all the players that are around. And to be honest, I think there could be even more. So I mean, it's great to see that so many people are working on such a hard problem and such an important problem, and that we are given like different shots and we're using different approaches for different also sub problems. Uh, but I really see it also as a as an entire new industry that's in the making. So. Basically, where the car, electric car industry was in, in, the, in the 90s, early 2000s, and where it's now, where you have different suppliers, different uh, car manufacturers, you have even like buses, like um, different kind of types of vehicles. How I see it with the with the entire transportation sector when it comes to cargo and passenger, also very much like rail guided or also navigation. So I think it's like tremendously important that we like coordinate uh, for standards and interoperability. But uh, I think just like having so many uh, solutions that hopefully like most of them will stick and, and will be implemented, it's just great to see because as, as also Phil said before, it's a super important problem. It's a super hard problem. It's basically yeah, how we can transport goods and passengers in a sustainable manner for yeah, the, the hopefully near future. Yeah, maybe that's a learning also from the railway industry because as you might know, there's different standards in, in almost every aspect of the way the, the train tracks are have a different width from country to country the electrification sometimes is not working you need uh, certifications for your trains in each country so sometimes it's not easy to go from one country to the other so the railway industry probably has a lot of insights and learnings and or mistakes already made maybe or or maybe some advantages but yeah let's go to another um, viewer question from Vukasin Latinovic, who kind of goes into what Steph, Stefan just said, is what about the future of the truck industry? So will all these new technologies and projects totally disrupt the trucks? Will there be no more trucks uh, on the streets? Uh, how do you see this, guys? I'll give, I'll give you the first try. Well. Um, <laughs> we showed the map of where we want to be in the future that indicates there is a special sector where we will have kind of that tunnel it's it's a very expensive building some building such a tunnel is really expensive so you can't go kind of to the to to the remote areas that are not as dense dense populated as maybe kind of that main uh, arm in switzerland along switzerland or other countries so there will always in my opinion be place for other modes of transportation and trucking doesn't have to stay dirty. I mean, 
we are talking about electrical vehicles, look at arrival or companies like these, look at uh, hydrogen, which is even smarter than electricity. Um, I mean, th these things, whatever the mode of transport or will take a different, the same mode of transportation, just with another energy form or another way of moving it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I think, you know, everything is already at capacity. So by introducing new, more efficient modes to address the areas which have the highest, uh, you know, frequency of use, shifting that over to Hyperloop or something like that, then simply just allows other parts of the system which have uh, more remote environments, less frequency to be using used trucks in those areas. And certainly first, last mile, shorter uh, destination deliveries will also require at least vans. Phil, do you want to add to this? I, I think there's there's a, there's a few things. I mean, first, first of all, there's a there's a massive shortage of, of trained truck drivers in the UK, in North America, in continental Europe. So it's not a case of putting people out of work. It's about you know the, fill, you know moving the, the the surplus capacity in the future. I think that obviously there there are um, lots of smart brains going into cleaning up the industry. Um, but the, the, the other element is currently within, when you look at warehouse automation, it's very automated in the heart of the warehouse. You can pick significant numbers of, of items very quickly, but on the edges, it's still very manual. It's still very inefficient. And you order stuff on, on Amazon or wherever, the goods are picked very quickly. You still need to fill that vehicle up before it leads, leaves the warehouse and, and heads towards you know, the final destination. And a significant, and still even then, a significant proportion of um, freight vehicles are carrying empty space. About 40% of the volume of freight is moving on, on roads in the UK is, is, is empty, is vacant. So it's still very inefficient. So it's a case of looking for newer, um, newer solutions, through hydrogen, electric, electric autonomous, and, 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 and also thinking beyond electric vehicles. How can you interface with these electric vehicles or, or autonomous vehicles to, 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 to address this, this massive challenge that we're facing? Great, and if none of you want to add to this anymore, um, we have another question from Alfred Mergeli who's asking what are the biggest risks today? So maybe let's go to each other and, and not just go into the risk, but the challenges. Uh, so let's start with YouTube. You're building a test track. You, you want to accelerate this. Uh, go, go take us through your decision-making process. How are you looking at things and, and where do you see the challenges and the risks at the moment? It's a great question, especially for such uh, like a uh, young industry, because there is also an example from from Germany, the TransRapid system. Um, some of you might have heard of it. It was like a high speed train system and they built a test track similarly how we want to build one here in Switzerland. And they had an accident on this test track and it basically killed the entire project. I mean, they were then able to outsource or basically then further sell some of the some of the technology that is now implemented in, in the, in the high-speed railways in China, but it really was a massive setback. So also for us here to test it in Switzerland, security is really one of the number one priorities because it could, it could really put us years, decades back if there's anything happening. I mean, we're glad there are no passengers being uh, transported or like are involved in the tests in our track. So that's for sure already like um, decreasing our risk factors, but but still, I mean, security also for later, like basically scalable security measures are key because if you're traveling with such high speeds, you're because of different reasons, you want to avoid any kind of complications and any 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 risks that uh, involves passengers. So I think to really also prove like provide the proof of concept, it's basically we're not just testing technology, we're testing the risks or we're testing the security system. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Security being a, a big risk factor. Phil, 
Is this the same with Magway? What are your biggest obstacles? Well, I, I think the biggest, the biggest risk to the industry as a whole is just lack of ambition. Yeah, we, all, we need to be um, ambitious and, and, and really, and, and it's great to see more and more people coming into this space. From where we're, you know, we, we, from where we're sitting, we think we're literally at the birth of the railway, where the, where the Stevensons were, you know, 150 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting to, 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 be in that, to, to, to be in the space. Um, that's the, only, that's the, the biggest risk from, from, from where we're sitting. And what about Cargo Sutra? Where do you see the biggest risk? Uh, at the moment, because we are starting and building our system already from inside out, so from the cities to the outside, I think the, the biggest issue at the moment for us is getting finding space, finding space where you can do logistics. If you look to how the cities develop, you hardly get a room in the heart of a city. Although you need to feed the material or you need to deliver all the things, people don't want to have a logistics company in the middle of a city, uh, whatever you do. And even the old or the, the train locations that are not used anymore, it's, it's extremely hard to get a location for that. And then the next step, if you go outside and if you start building a tunnel, a tunnel across the country, at some point we need to get in or out of the ground. And at that point you need to have a hub. So finding hub locations and then generating traffic around such a location is already another uh, big headache for, for, for kind of the uh, cities and the cantons around. And so, so really finding locations and building a logistical system beneath existent infrastructure seems to be a big, big issue. Mm -hmm. Security concerns, lack of ambition, and not enough space to test these things. Anita, do you have some other concerns for the future of freight, be it on the ground or in the air? Well, I would say um, I would say from the ground, and this is a non-technical answer, and something which I, I've seen in my career and now as more of a customer forward-facing consultant to the space is funding uh, the cost to implement any ground-based infrastructure project, whether it's for transportation purposes or dual-use passenger transportation, is prohibitive. Um, and then couple that to public acceptance. Um, you can take a look at California's California's high-speed rail initiative has been fraught with problems from the beginning because people are opposed to it from environmental reasons, from cost reasons, from everything, you name it. Same thing with high-speed rail in Britain. So I think whenever you have a massive infrastructure project, you have to have strong public political acceptance and support along with the funding to go with it to make it a reality. So sadly, I think any new form of transport faces that uphill battle. Um, and you've got to be able to make that case to the public as to why this is the right solution for them. Mm -hmm. This is, thank you, Anita, an excellent segue into our probably last question because we have about five more minutes left. Um, and this is with all these mobility concepts, who should be in the driver's seat? Is it the government who are funding projects? Anita just mentioned that the, the lacking funds uh, are not very helpful. Also, Stefan's concern with the space, that's the government. Or should it be actually startups, big companies? Should Elon Musk be the, the leader? Who, who do you think, guys, is in the driver's seat? Um, since you're unmuted already, Stefan, you can begin. Uh, we take the seat in our project. We are privately funded. There's no support from the state or so, so we do it on our own. And we have a lot of support from the various country, uh, companies. So uh, from that perspective, I think we are good to go. It's uh, just like prim primarily the issues that I, I spoke about before. Who wants to go next? Uh, happy, happy to continue. So uh, from our point of view, there for sure needs to be like a lot of collaboration as it's a really hard problem in different fields. And um, so we are also, as that's also why we from the beginning as, as Eurogroup decided to, to choose this approach of building a, such a, a technology uh, platform to bring all the efforts together uh, who should be in the driver's seat? I dare uh, agree also with Phil, uh, or also basically how Carpenter is handling it to, to the extent that there needs to be a lot of ambition, there needs to be a lot of courage at the beginning, especially in such an early phase. So I don't really see the public 
um, like the government or any kind of public office is taking this driver's seat. So usually it's startups, it's it's bold pioneers, but but still like um, there's much more to do also in terms of 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 like cross industry talking to each other, collaborating, helping uh, out to really push 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 those technologies and those solutions. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, both you, timing is a, is a is a great thing. You know, before the First World War, over a third of the vehicles on American roads were electric vehicles. The first underground pipe system was installed in, in London 160 years ago. And there's an under, a pipe system in, in Chicago as well. Um, so it, it will take, you know, both an effort from the, the, the private and public sector to, to make this happen in terms of rights of way, in terms of enabling, having the technology to enable the system. But what, what's happening now is the current infrastructure is just not working. The changing consumer habits has leapfrogged um, the, 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 the infrastructure that's, that's supporting it. And you know, the, 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 the challenges for our planet means we need to think big and, and, and think beyond the existing solutions to, 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 to solve this, this existential problem. So I think that, you know, the, that there is a will in both public and private sector for, for different reasons um, to, to, to come up with new solutions. Yeah, and I, I would agree with all of my fellow panelists. Um, it, it's going to take a village or a community to make this happen. I think from the technology perspective, that naturally it comes better from an innovative uh, source, which is usually from startups in the private sector. But the amount of funding and capital that's required, the right of way, the land acquisition, that really does require government involvement. And, and the government side, as Phil just said, really needs to take a leap of faith to be able to do something uh, much greater than we've done before, not more of the same. Thank you very much. And also, Alfred Mergeli says that you answered his question perfectly. So he's very happy. And he shared his LinkedIn and information in the chat if you want to keep in touch with him. So one more minute left. So I have one final question. Um, of course, if you want to reach out to the panelists before or afterwards, um, you can find more details, their contact details on the Swiss Next website. Um, so we've been talking about the future of freight. So maybe last question, and this is for, for each one of you, uh, is let's talk near future. What do you expect to see happen this year? What, what kind of innovation, either in your project or someone else, uh, what do you see in the industry in freight going to happen in 2021? Maybe let's start with Phil. Well, en encouragingly for us is the underground freight and, and, and pipe delivery has gained a lot more column inches in the press. So over the last sort of, you know, I'd say 18 to 12 to 18 months, whereas you know, it was all about drones, it was all about EVs, it's all about autonomous vehicles. You know, it's being recognized as a viable, acceptable solution. You know, you've got Tencent in China, you've got Toyota in Japan, You've got um, you know, Google with Sidewalk Labs. All of them are incorporating underground freight as a solution, uh, as, part of, as part of the solution. So that's what we, we see um, you know, happening and being part of the debate about how do we sustainably service the population and these changing consumer habits. Great answer. Uh, Stefan, do you want to go next? What do you see in 2021 happening? Yeah, I think very similar to what Phil just said. It's, it's really the fundamental change in shipment sizes, be it consumer, be it business. I mean, it, it really seems like a very, very strong change over the last year. And uh, also going forward, that whole crisis will kind of downsize shipments and will, will show that we have to prepare the systems for being even more agile, faster, and flexible and individual. That's kind of the key thing for me. What about you, Gregory? From my point of view, I think 
this year in 2021, we will see, or I definitely hope to see that there is more funding coming to our spaces, all of our spaces, um, at least in the vacuum transport sector. I, I think we saw some very positive signals and I hope this, those will manifest also in, in the right funding coming to great projects in this space. We can really also make a difference. And on the other hand, I mean, personally for, for our case, we are super eager to hopefully put together a first demonstrator by, by end of this year to also um, like provide the proof of concept of some of the technologies we were, we were working on. As, as we heard it before, um, public acceptance is still very, very important. So also to show the public that such, such systems can work and how they, are, how they will look like when they're also being implemented. Yeah. And lastly, Anita, same question for you. Well, in my field, specifically for electric aviation, I think we're going to see far more uh, drone usage for um, last mile delivery. Um, and on the larger aircraft side, we're seeing more of a shift over to sustainable aviation fuels. Um, but I do think that I hope in 2021, there'll be a country who makes a decision to really move forward with a Hyperloop system for transportation purposes, at least in a planning phase. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. And Thank you very much, guys. This was an excellent panel. We are a little bit over time, which stresses me being Swiss. <laughs> um, so thanks again, Dr. Anita Sengupta, Gregory Inaun, Stefan Gottlöcke, and Phil Davis for joining this conversation and sharing your very cool insights into this future of freight. If you guys, or if the audience would like to participate in our conversation, feel free to contact me or any of the speakers. We will be talking in one week with a totally different panel about the future of Hyperloop and infrastructure, boring, tunneling. So who, who should build it, who should pay for it and so on. So we'll continue our conversation about Hyperloop in exactly one week. So thank you very much guys for joining. Good evening to Europe and good morning to the US. Have a great day and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Oh, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.